So tonight's speaker, Professor Hanley is a professor of political science in the Morrissey College of Arts and Sciences at Boston College. He teaches and his teaching and research focus on enlightenment political theory, Adam Smith and politics and literature. His academic career has taken him to many of the world's best institutions, Penn, Cambridge, Chicago, Yale, Harvard, and Marquette University, where he was the Mellon Distinguished Professor of Political Science before joining Boston College. He's an expert on philosophy of the Enlightenment period, with a particular emphasis on Adam Smith. His authorship includes a long list of academic articles and celebrated books, including Adam Smith and the Character of Virtue, Love's Enlightenment, Rethinking Charity and Modernity, Our Great Purpose, Adam Smith on Living a Better Life, which I want to personally plug because it is a fantastic read. Uh, Professor, Hanley's, uh, Professor Hanley's work also includes significant edited and translated volumes, including Penguin Classics edition of Adam Smith's The Theory of Moral Sentiments. So on a personal note, I can't rate our great purpose, Adam Smith on Living a Better Life, more highly. It offers the reader access to Smith's rich economic and moral philosophies in ways that not only inform, but inspire a critical examination of life. And in a sense, it provides application of philosophy without being a self-help book. And moreover, it reconciles the alleged contradictions between Smith's major works, The Wealth of Nations, and The Theory of Moral Sentiments. So arguably, Smith's most famous work, The Wealth of Nations, contains groundbreaking insight that still informs economic thinking with regard to trade, specialization, and sources of economic growth, which is significant when one considers that Smith was living during the nascent stages of what economists call, often call the Great Enrichment. The Wealth of Nations has inspired a great number of philosophers, social scientists, political thinkers, policymakers, and more and since, its, since its first publication in 1776. And tonight, Professor Hanley will offer understanding of how another great book of the time, Edward Gibbon's Decline and Fall of the Roman Empire, inspired Smith's thinking with regard to political stability. So please join me in welcoming, welcoming Professor Ryan Patrick Hanley. <laughs> Well, thank you, Court, for that very kind uh, introduction. Thanks very much to the George Washington Forum for being willing to host this, and thank you guys all for coming tonight. Um, uh, my hope is to speak for about, uh, I think we have an hour and a half together. I'd like to keep my remarks to about 40, 45 minutes so that we can have some back and forth and some discussion. But I want to get into these questions I'm going to talk about by going back to a year. And uh, with some of you at dinner, we were talking a little bit about 1775 and the great events that happened in 1775. I asked the stumper, and I'm going to give away that I, I live in Concord, Massachusetts. So the 19th of April, 1775, is a big deal in Concord, Massachusetts for the shot heard around the world. Um, I could go down the rabbit hole of talking about Concord for a long time. But I'll stick with Smith tonight. And I'm going to go all the way from 1775 to 1776, because I want to start by talking about one of the great works that was published in 1776. And the book that I have in mind was a massive tome, one that inaugurated a revolution in the social sciences that we can say without any exaggeration was every bit as significant as the revolution then happening in the Atlantic political world. It accomplished this, this book did, because of its author's remarkable capacities on several different fronts. One a staggering amount of erudition and an encyclopedic understanding of the history of law and government going back to antiquity all the way up into the modern world. In addition, a really intimate familiarity gained with firsthand exposure to the leading theorists of political economy of the mid 18th century in Paris and in Britain. And third, a real sensitivity not just to the antiquarian uses of history, but how historical forces really shape the politics of the age in which they were living and that we would go on to inherit. For all these reasons, this book went on to, to really uh, uh, be celebrated in its age and continues today to be lauded as a founding text in its particular field. Now, what was the book? If we're in a room full of economists, they all stand up and say instantly, it was of course, Adam Smith's inquiry into the wealth, nature and causes of the wealth of nations. But everything I've just said applies to what I'll call for now another book of 1776, which is not Smith, but actually, as Court mentioned in his introduction, Edward Gibbon's massive tome, Gibbon's book that was published also in six volumes under the title, The Decline and Fall of the Roman Empire. 
And I want to start here for a very particular reason that has to do with more than just the happenstance that they were published in the same year. It's that I think we learn a lot about Smith if we read Smith's famous book of 1776 through the lens established by Gibbon's great book of 1776. And I'm not alone in thinking about the connections. For what it's worth, Smith and Gibbon were friends. Gibbon, in particular, was deeply influenced by Smith. And Gibbon's book started in 1776, but he'd write other volumes all the way into the early 1780s. And there he'd start citing Smith, and especially Smith's views on economics. So that direction of the causal arrow of influence is undeniable. Smith shaped Gibbon's outlook, and Gibbon went on to shape modern historical thinking. But what I want to do tonight is flip the causal arrow, not to think in terms of how we as historians often think about Smith's influence on Gibbon, but rather thinking about Smith's work from the standpoint of Gibbon's question. And specifically, I want to revisit the wealth of nations with Gibbon's particular question in mind, the central question of his major work on Rome, that has to do with the causes of the decline and ultimately collapse and fall of the greatest political uh, power that had been known in antiquity, the Roman Empire. Now, I learned a long time ago from a friend that teaches at the military academy in West Point. He taught me something called bluff, bottom line up front. At the military academy, they give you the central claims up front and then uh, give an exposition. I'm going to do a version of that now. To bottom line it up front, what I think we learn about Smith by visiting him through this perspective, something that's not seen often enough, but we get to see something very fundamental in his deep interest in political decline and decay. In particular, what we learn is Smith's deep appreciation of a very specific paradox. And here's what I want to put out as bluntly as possible at the beginning. The paradox concerns the relationship between two things, national opulence on the one hand and national power on the other. Put simply, Smith tells us again and again that the goal of political economy is to promote national opulence. But he also believes, I want to show and try and convince you of over the course of the next few minutes, that the growth of national opulence also necessarily leads to a decline in political power. In some very deep sense, Smith thinks that in economic growth are undeniably the seeds of national decline. Now, for evidence that Smith in fact believes this, we have a number of different statements from his own pen. And I want to start just by beginning with two of them. Now, and I warn you at the outset, I'm going to show some slides. None of the slides have any pictures. It's all going to be text. But as a textual scholar and as an interpreter of Smith, I think it's important always never to make blanket claims, but to go back to the text and show you the evidence that I have for the claims that I want to make here. So to do that, I want to put some fragments of his arguments out on paper so that you can read them with me and that together we can see what his arguments are. So I want to start by some of his most um, forthright statements of this paradox. Here's two that come in. Um, these are actually LJ. LJA refers to one of the versions of the notes to Smith's lectures on jurisprudence that he gave as a university professor. We can talk a little bit more about Q&A, how those map on to the wealth of nations. In many ways, it's not unfair to see them as a rough draft for the wealth of nations. I'll make some qualifications to that, but I think that we can use that as a point of departure. Smith says some really fascinating things in the, in the lectures on jurisprudence, including this, quote, it must happen that the improvement of arts and commerce must make a great declension in the force and power of the republic in all cases. And then secondly, quote, whenever therefore arts and commerce engage the citizens, either as artisans or master tradesmen, the strength and force of the city must be very much diminished. Now, these are just two of Smith's many statements on the relationship between economic progress and national power. And many others can be adduced, and I want to bring forth some others over the course of the talk. But I want to begin here for a real specific reason. I think these capture really well 
not only the inverse relationship between growth and national power, but also the necessary relationship between these. As I read these quotes, of, I, of course, overemphasized that word oft repeated, must. Smith invites us to see this not just as a paradox, but almost as a law of necessity. When one thing happens, the other thing must happen. He's deeply invested in this point, and I think he's so invested that he invites us to ask two questions. The first is conceptual. That is, it's a why question. Point blank, why did Smith believe that commercial wealth brings national decline? So what, that is, does Smith think is the mechanism that drives this process that he invites us to think about as a necessary process? That said, if the first question is conceptual, the second question that I think this prompts is political. Not why is this happening, but rather what's to be done about it? What sorts of things should real politicians in real states be thinking about and doing? Especially real politicians in wealthy states. What should they be doing? What should we as citizens of such a state be doing in order to stave off this seemingly necessary process of decline and fall. Smith took this to be a remarkably urgent question, and especially urgent because the way he presents this as not just mere decline, not just simple decay, but in terms of existential annihilation. So we're going to see again and again, he comes back to the idea of these states not just decaying over time, but collapsing and falling and ending. So the what is to be done question was an extremely important question, as Smith saw it, as a theorist of economic growth. Now that said, I want to use the time in the lecture mostly to focus on that first question, the mechanisms. I hope that we'll talk a little bit in Q&A about why this might be relevant to us today, what we today might take away from this, what sorts of political activities might follow from this. But I really want to focus on Smith's theory of the processes and the mechanisms that he points to to explain the ways in which economic progress and national decline are tied. And the two things that I want to especially focus on, and this will structure the way that I sort of present this in the talk, is that he makes two discrete claims about this relationship. The first set of claims concerns how national opulence renders a state susceptible to external threats. And alongside this, he makes a second set of claims, how national opulence renders a state susceptible to internal threats. I want to take those up in order over the course of the talk, beginning with the external, then turning to the internal threats, and concluding with a brief look at three case studies that Smith presents of, of actual, real, opulent nations that either fell or were falling. And the three examples that Smith puts before us that we'll look at one is Gibbon's example of the fall of ancient Rome. The second was the collapse of Ming Dynasty China in the 17th century at the hands of the Tartars. And the third was Britain in his own day and the threats faced by uh, uh, the British Empire in 1776. So let's start with the first question, the national opulence and the external threats. So I want to, um, to motivate this turn, I want to start with one of Smith's most direct lessons. There's a line that sometimes gets trotted out by particular types of readers of Smith. And the quote that I have in mind is his very direct advice. This is Smith speaking, quote, defense is much more important than opulence, end quote. Now, if you look at where he says that, he makes it in context. If any of you actually, I, I'm going to cite some passages. I hope some of you might be moved to read these and go back to them to see the evidence for yourself. Smith makes that claim in Wealth of Nations 4232 in the midst of a really technical discussion of the Navigation Acts of 1651, not the ones that the American Revolution was fought over, but the ones of the previous century. But I emphasize this because the idea at its heart of the significance of defense occupies a really key place in Smith's theory of both the purpose and the very ends of government. So to see this, what does Smith say the purpose of government is? He tells us very strikingly in the beginning of the fifth book of the Wealth of Nations, quote, the first duty of the sovereign is that of protecting the society from the violence and invasion of other independent societies. 
So the first quote makes clear the primary aim of any government, which is to guard against the threat of foreign external violence. But not only does Smith see the current purpose of government to be to guard against these threats, he also sees that where society comes from, it's a very origins lie in trying to defend against these threats. And so I won't read all of the passages here, but you can see these are other passages from his lectures on jurisprudence. And he goes back to some of the pre-modern ages in his, what's called his stadial theory. He talks about the ages of hunters, the ages of shepherds, the ages of farmers, all before coming to the modern commercial age. But in each of them, he emphasizes that where does society come from? Where did collective life actually emerge from? It emerges from a collective concern to guard against, quote unquote, a common enemy. That is to provide, quote unquote, mutual defense and assistance. So here and elsewhere, Smith really emphasizes the origin of society and the end of government lying in protecting against invaders. I think all of that's clear enough just from these quotes, and we could look at many more passages. What's interesting is the challenge that economic growth poses to this process. And here's where the paradox comes in. One might be tempted to think that economic growth and national opulence makes defense easier. You can think of all kinds of very simple and familiar arguments for why this would be so. Increased tax base means more military funding. A wealthier government's better able to borrow in wartime to uh, uh, contract useful debt. Smith emphasizes almost none of that. Instead, what he focuses on is something exactly the opposite, what an economist might call the negative externalities consequent to economic growth. And these negative externalities consequent to the progress of opulence take a couple of forms. Here's one. In these lectures on jurisprudence, Smith traces out the quote unquote bad effects of commerce. And I mentioned this to some of the students at dinner. I think one of the things that makes Smith so fascinating is the fact that he's not an ideologue and he tells both sides of the story. Smith was a champion of commercial society, but he always wanted to tell the truth and never pull the wool over people's eyes. And if something bad was happening, he did not try to pretend it didn't exist for the sake of giving a biased one-sided part of the story. He tells both sides. And here in defending commercial society, he tells us what the bad effects of commerce are. So here's one of them. And if you don't mind, I will quote this, partially because Smith's language is really striking. He was, you might not know that he was a professor, his first job was as a professor of rhetoric. So he's very interested in language and trying to elicit reactions from an audience. So, this presumably came from his lectures to his undergraduate students. And I don't, I'm not going to try and pretend that I know how he delivered them, but I know it had some force behind it. So if you don't mind, quote, another bad effect of commerce is that it sinks the courage of mankind and tends to extinguish martial spirit. In all commercial countries, the division of labor is infinite, and everyone's thoughts are employed about one particular thing. The defense of the country is therefore committed to a certain set of men who have nothing else to do. And among the bulk of the people, military courage diminishes. By having their minds constantly employed on the arts of luxury, they grow effeminate and dastardly. I'm glad there was a laugh at that. We should, I hope, talk a little bit about Smith's gendered language there and his interest in talking in terms of effeminacy, as he does here and masculinity as he does elsewhere. That's worthy of thinking through. I'm gonna put that aside though to focus on the main point here, which is his main point here is this corruption that he's labeling effeminacy and dastardliness. He ties directly back to the progress of wealth and specifically the mechanism of the engine of the progress of wealth in modern society, divided specialized labor. So Smith is suggesting here that there's a bit of a moral corruption that comes out from divided specialized labor. As we might talk about this today, if we wanted to put it in 21st century language, this sort of factory work makes us soft. It makes us less able to go out into the field and take up arms in our nation's defense. 
You know, it makes us, you know, we hear stories from the military about how recruits today can do less push-ups and have slower mile times. All these sorts of things are sort of built into Smith's concern here. But Smith also makes another argument. It's not just that commercial opulence has a moral effect that makes us susceptible to external threats, but also commercial opulence has a structural or institutional effect. And so Smith suggests that these two compromise national defense. Here in this next slide, he gives us another one of these statements that begins with a must necessarily. And in this case, he gives that main claim up front that I've been emphasizing, quote, it must necessarily happen that as a state of this sort, commercial sort, advances in arts and improvements in society, its power and strength must be greatly diminished. But what's interesting here is now what he's going to say about how this happens and why this is necessarily so. Quote, as the arts and improvements and consequently the easiness of procuring livelihood increase, it is true, the city will become more populous. And that's really important because for Smith, the wealth of nations consists in having a large population. If anybody asks you what Smith thinks the wealth of nations is, it's people power. It's having a large labor force and a growing population. But here's the paradox, that even as we get wealthier and have a larger population, quote, it is true the city will become more populous, that is, its number of inhabitants will increase, but the soldiers will be greatly less. The number of people will be greater, but the number of fighting people will be very small. So that the improvement of arts and manufactures, which I'll try and show more fully hereafter than I've hitherto done, must necessarily happen in every state of this sort and will greatly weaken its strength. Smith here is making a really important claim. More people, but less warriors. Why? What he goes on to explain is that in a commercial society in which people are engaged in manufacturing, in artisanship, in which they're doing things that are lucrative pursuits and maximizing their own self-interest through use of their labor power, the thing that ends up happening is that every moment they spend away from their workshop, from their bench, from their trade in the marketplace, is an hour in which they're sacrificing real gains and real profit. To be compelled then to go out and serve in the military is directly inimical to their self-interest. So there is a strong disincentive for individuals working in an advanced market economy, not unlike our own, never to want to take time off and to go volunteer for the National Guard or to serve. The result, Smith thinks, again, must necessarily. This growth in our productivity power and our labor power leads to de decreased fighting force. So what I want to emphasize up to now is that Smith thinks first, there are moral causes consequent to national opulence that are, make us more susceptible to external threats. There's structural or institutional effects of the progress in commerce that also make us susceptible. But third and finally, Smith points out one other very important part of this process that has to do with the relationship between national wealth and military security. The problem is that not only, as we've been emphasizing up to now, are rich nations less able to defend themselves against foreign attack, it's that they also become more attractive to the attackers at the same time. Not only are they less able to defend against foreign attack, they're also more likely to be subject to foreign attack because they look like attractive targets. So this leads to Smith's uh, uh, next uh, 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 observation about how national opulence, as he says, necessarily, quote unquote, provokes invasion. And so here, I won't go again reading the entire slide, but Smith again tells us that this wealth that always follows commercial progress necessarily, quote, provo provokes the invasion of all their neighbors. An industrious, and upon that account a wealthy nation, is of all nations the most likely to be attacked. And unless the state takes some new measures for the public defense, 
The natural habits of the people render them altogether incapable of defending themselves, end quote. So at the end of this quotation, Smith starts shading into the issue that most people like me, professional Smith scholars, have been focused on. So a lot of people have written on Smith's defense of a very particular type of institution, and that is a federally funded standing permanent army. So Smith argues, and he made a big intervention in his time, that it's not enough to have a volunteer militia force to defend a wealthy nation. You had to have a standing army that you kept in peacetime as well as in wartime. That got him into a lot of hot water. There's a long train of ancient classical Republican thinking that pushed back against that. We can talk about that if you want. But what I want to emphasize now is not just the institutional solution, army versus militia. That's important. But what's really important, especially important for us today, isn't Smith's solution, but the problem. And the problem or the paradox of national opulence and the way it makes us both less able to defend ourselves and makes us more attractive as targets for the poor. All of this, Smith thinks, has a very clear and almost inevitable upshot. The upshot is quite simply what I called earlier existential annihilation, or what I called in the title of the talk, flipping around Smith's little title, the death of the nation. And here's one place where he sums that up. In my last lecture, I endeavored to show you how the Republican governments naturally came to lose their strength and be ruined. Improvements in arts and cultivation unfit the people from going to war so that the strength is greatly diminished and it falls a sacrifice to some of its neighbors. Now, with that terribly happy, inspiring image in place, I want to turn. I want to move to the second part of the talk and make a shift. I've been talking up to now about national opulence and external threats. And now I want to shift to the other side of Smith's argument, which concerns not the external threats, but the internal threats. Because one of the things I think is really fascinating about Smith's argument, and the way in which he approaches a lot of problems, is that he's a very much a multifactorial thinker. He thinks in terms of systems, he thinks in terms of numerous inputs, and he thinks always in a variety of different explanations. He's suspicious of people that think only dogmatically about one particular type of explanation. So with this particular issue, as he thinks through the challenge, he now shifts to give us another side of the argument, not the external, but the internal. Now, so what then are the internal threats that opulence brings? Let me start by suggesting, by going back to what we did in the first part of the talk, and that is Smith's vision of the, um, what we called uh, uh, the uh, ends or purpose of government. I mentioned earlier that Smith sees defense as the primary aim of the modern sovereign, external defense against enemies. But he follows this in The Wealth of Nations, part five, by laying out a second primary aim of government. That second primary game, aim doesn't have to do with external threats, but with internal threats. And he calls this then, the second duty of the sovereign is not to provide for defense, but to provide for what he calls justice and security. And he tells us point blank, the second duty of the sovereign is that of protecting as far as possible every member of the society from the injustice or oppression of every other member of it which he calls the duty of establishing an exact administration of justice. I wanted to have this out on the table because when you see it, you start seeing there's a certain symmetry. Smith often uses the same language in multiple places. And when you're sort of keyed into that, you can see how his argument connects over places. But here he's talked about the first duty of the sovereign and the second duty of the sovereign. And when you see this here, what you see, what I find really fascinating, is the first duty of the sovereign has to do with guarding against violence, but it's the violence that comes from foreign invaders. The second duty also, though, has to do with violence, but it's not the violence of foreign neighbors, but rather the violence of our neighbors within the state. And as Smith develops this idea, he says some extremely striking things that don't often get as much attention as I think they deserve. What exactly is the threat of, for, of domestic violence that we have to worry about? 
it's easy enough to say we need to worry about these poor nations out there that seem to be always threatening our borders. When it comes to the internal threats, Smith identifies something very specific. The internal threat that's omnipresent in an advanced commercial society comes from inequality and especially the tensions between rich and poor. And this is a long paragraph. But it's a striking side of Smith that not a lot of people know about. So I hope you don't mind if I quote this. And I've given you both the citations to the published and the unpublished versions of this claim, so that if you're so moved, you can, you can look it up yourself. But this claim is a quote, when in the manner above mentioned, some have great wealth and others nothing, it is necessary that the arm of authority should be continually stretched forth. And permanent laws or regulations, which may ascertain the property of the rich from the inroads of the poor, who would otherwise continually make encroachments upon it and settle in what the infringement of this property consists and in what cases they will be liable to punishment. Now, laws and government may be considered in this and indeed in every case as a combination of the rich to oppress the poor and preserve to themselves the inequality of the goods which would otherwise be soon destroyed by the attacks of the poor, who if not hindered by the government would soon reduce the others to an equality with themselves by open violence. Now, I emphasize this, and I hope that the way we've been talking about threats and violence, as dark as that seems, helps to bring out Smith's real worry here. Because when people read this today, and when they talk about Smith and what he thought government was there for, they often say something that's true, but a little bland. They say something like, for Smith, government exists to protect property rights. That's true, but it's really excessively bland, or as I would call it, anodyne. It doesn't capture what the real worry is here. Not just protecting property rights in some sort of abstract Lockean sense, but protecting the property of the rich from the quote unquote, attacks of the poor, and the possibility of quote unquote open violence that exists if ever the state fails to maintain the coercive threat of punishment over those who would violate property rights. Smith presents something very interesting here. Civil society exists to preserve peace, but it's a very precarious peace among people that otherwise would devolve quickly to become enemies. And this, at any rate, is how Smith presents civil society in The Wealth of Nations. He tells us here, again, quote, whenever there is great property, there is great inequality. And he talks about the indignation of the poor and the idea that the rich, quote, cannot sleep a single night in security unless they have the protection of the, quote, powerful arm of the civil magistrate. We could go through other passages too, but I bring these out to emphasize how Smith worries deeply about the potential instability in a society in which there's great inequalities between rich and poor. Now, what implications does this have if I have that right about what Smith's worry is here, what implications does this have for Smith's own undeniable interest in trying to make societies wealthier and indeed trying to make all human beings in those societies wealthier? That is, what, do what does the growth of commercial opulence then do to this dynamic? Does it make us safer in disturbing certain social orders or does it make things more precarious? Smith, in a variety of places, suggests that the commercial opulence that starts challenging old social orders of rich and poor, he suggests in many places that this is a very good thing indeed. For anybody that's interested in this, the third book of The Wealth of Nations that maybe some of you have read, it's where he describes the quote unquote natural progress of opulence. And here he tells the story about how medieval feudalism came to an end. Medieval feudalism was a system of agricultural production in which a few lords controlled the lives of many thousands of serfs. Smith presents it as abysmal and the exact opposite of what he calls modern freedom. Modern freedom only came with commerce, 
where people were able to liberate themselves from direct dependence upon these feudal lords, to go for themselves and work in cities as tradesmen, as artificers, and in commercial dealers, and to make their own wealth so that they would no longer have to be subject to the whims of a few strong men. Smith thus clearly presents the growth of opulence as a good thing for society and for productively skewering some of these divisions between rich and poor. Some of you have heard the term creative destruction. Smith clearly thinks that there is a form of creative destruction happening on the social level that's very good here. But Smith also worries that, in fact, that there can be a little bit of dysfunction introduced by these particular changes. One in particular, the dynamics of rich and poor change within institutions as people become wealthier. And they change especially in the military. So here I'm going to skip over one particular, some important claims he makes about class tension. But um, actually, I'll go to the bottom of this here. Uh, if you look at the bottom of this particular slide, Smith makes a suggestion about what happens when arts and luxury progress and commercial progress uh, emerges. He talks about then who goes into the military. And here he makes this very interesting claim to my mind. Quote, the rich and better sort of people will no longer engage in the service. And so one thing that Smith traces out in a variety of his lectures and published sources, that as people have become wealthier over time, again, they've wanted to spend more time making money and less time involved in public service. He talks about the courts in ancient Athens in which they came to be dominated by the poor because people no longer wanted to do jury duty because they could make money. The wealthy had an opportunity to make money outside. He talks here about military service. Again, people don't want to, the rich don't want to serve, so they turn everything over to the poor. And Smith is very explicit about talking about this in modern Britain especially, in which the army now has become the province specifically of the poor and the wealthy aristocrats have all withdrawn. Why might that be a problem? Smith doesn't spell that out exactly, but he invites us to imagine what could happen if military power in a democracy lacks certain types of social checks. I want to push forward, though, to talk about um, not exactly simply this institutional challenge on the domestic level, but another type of challenge that also has to do with the effects of divided specialized labor. And here, let me bring up one other slide here that's interesting. We talked about this, some of the students, we talked about this at dinner too. We were talking about Karl Marx and the effects of specialized labor uh, in the generation of what's sometimes called alienation, that is the commodification of workers and the way in which they are in various different ways dehumanized. Smith, too, thinks there's something deeply dehumanizing about the conditions of modern labor. And this, to my mind, again, is one of these fascinating things in Smith. He begins The Wealth of Nations. Book one is all about the upsides of the division of labor. You've read about the pin factory, more pins, cheaper pins. It's good for everybody. In part five, he talks about what happens to the pin makers. And what happens to the pin makers are not good. Quote, the understandings of men are necessarily formed by the ordinary employments. The man whose whole life is spent in performing a few simple operations, of which the effects to are perhaps always the same or very nearly the same, has no occasion to exert his understanding or to exercise his invention in finding out expedients for removing difficulties which never occur. He naturally loses, therefore, the habit of such exertion and generally becomes as stupid and ignorant as it is possible for a human creature to become. His dexterity, his own particular trade, seems in this manner to be acquired at the expense of his intellectual, social, and martial virtues. But in every improved and civilized society, this is the state into which the laboring poor uh, must fall, into laboring poor, that is, the great body of the people, must necessarily fall unless government takes some pains to prevent it. Now, again, Smith scholars, all of us go to that last line because here, 
for all its misreputation of being a libertarian, small government, night watchman state, here he says, government has to do something to prevent this tragedy. I would very much enjoy talking about what Smith thinks needs to be done. But I don't want to lose sight of what the problem is that he sees here. It's a very specific problem with a very specific political consequence. The problem, again, is that this divided specialized labor and its repetition has made people, as he says, stupid and ignorant, Smith's words. That is, it doesn't just corrupt human beings in any abstract way. It corrupts them in a very specific way. And I think there's something really at stake when he says that there's this, all of this progress comes at the expense of, quote, his intellectual, social, and martial virtues. If you think back to the beginning of the talk, I really wanted to emphasize that problem of the martial virtues, right? Remember that stuff about effeminacy and, uh, uh, and, and how uh, people would go soft, all that kind of stuff. That made us bad warriors. There's a different problem here. The problem here isn't that people are becoming cowards or going soft somehow. It's that their intellectual virtues are becoming compromised, and they're becoming, as he says, stupid. That's a problem. What's really interesting is why Smith thinks it's a problem. Smith thinks that this is a problem, what he here calls stupidity, what he elsewhere calls mental mutilation, not because it's simply a human tragedy, though he thinks it is, not because it simply violates human dignity, though I would argue he thinks it does, but because it leads to a really specific political problem. People that are stupid are people that can be taken advantage of. And Smith makes as clear as he can what happens when these individuals, upon whom democratic stability depends, are no longer able to think. Here's Smith describing the worker that he's previously called mentally mutilated. Quote, the torpor of his mind renders him not only incapable of relishing or bearing a part in any rational conversation, but of conceiving any generous, noble, or tender sentiment, and consequently of forming any just judgment concerning many even of the ordinary duties of private life. Of the great and extensive interests of his country, he is altogether incapable of judging. So this isn't just stupidity in some sort of offhand sense. He here says that what's corrupted is judgment, and specifically, the judgment of individuals in their own private capacities and their private interests, and especially their judgment in being able to make decisions about the public interests and the interests of the nation. Why does that matter? Smith tells us in the last paragraph that sums all of this up, which is Wealth of Nations 51F61. Here's why, quote unquote, gross ignorance and stupidity matter in a civilized society. Quote, the more they are instructed, Smith thinks that they have to be instructed and there has to be education to offset this, quote, the less liable they are to the delusions of enthusiasm and superstition. They are more disposed to examine and more capable of seeing through the interested complaints of faction and sedition, and they are, upon that account, less apt to be misled into any wanton or unnecessary opposition to the measures of government. What has Smith just said? Why is it politically dangerous for a people to have been rendered, quote unquote, stupid by their employment? Because they'll be unable to judge those who try to take advantage of them. Those who, out of party interests, want to promote faction and sedition. Those who, out of a certain type of religious interest, would foment what he here calls superstition and enthusiasm and those who would stir people up to the degree that they would be misled into wanton or unnecessary opposition to the government themselves. Smith sees point blank a great potential for internal instability that comes from these potential domestic enemies, the demagogues who would stir up the people, the party leaders that would think about the interests of party over the nation, anybody that would try to manipulate those who have been harmed in their intellectual capacities for making good prudential judgments about their interests and the interests of the nation. Now, I will leave it to you, and maybe we can discuss in Q&A, to judge for yourself. My interest very much is explicating Smith's arguments. 
One has to judge for oneself whether and if this applies today, whether the challenges that we face in our own advanced opulent commercial republic have anything to do with this, and especially these images of faction, sedition, opposition, enthusiasm, and superstition. But leaving that to you, I want to go one last step and very quickly introduce Smith's very, I'm going to do this very briefly and too crudely, Smith's own reasons for thinking these were real matters of stake. And this goes to those three case studies that I said, I, I mentioned at the outset. All this stuff that I've been describing here wasn't armchair philosophy for Smith. He thinks it's what explains the greatest revolutions in human political history. He thinks in the first place, it caused the fall of Rome. What happened in Imperial Rome in the story Smith tells? These opulent, luxurious artisans no longer wanted to fight. They wanted to stay home. As a result, to defend themselves against their national enemies, they had to turn to mercenaries that they hired because they weren't able to fight themselves. And the mercenaries turned on them, and the empire of Rome fell at the hands of the Scythians and the northern Germans. The second case, China. Smith says that China in the 17th century was one of the, if not the most opulent nation the world had ever seen. And what happened in China? Smith tells the story about how these peaceful, commercial Chinese of 17th century Ming Dynasty China were overcome and fell in 1644 when they were attacked by their, what he calls, barbarian neighbors, the shepherding nomadic Tartars from the central steppes of Asia. For Smith, this is a second lesson in how opulent nations are continually susceptible to these threats of annihilation. Rome's ancient history, China at least happened a century before. What about Smith in his own day? Smith lived in Great Britain. And he sees that it is itself one of the most opulent nations ever to have lived. What relation does this have to the British Empire? Smith thinks a lot. We've mentioned already 1776. Smith writes extensively on the colonies. Smith was very involved with all the big political players in London and knew exactly what was happening with the calls for American independence and himself even championed American independence, uh, colonial independence in the end. But the threats to Britain and the breakup of the empire don't just come from the American colonists. Smith saw it closer to home in his own day. Something happened in 1745 in which there was a big fight over dynastic possession of the crown. There was a Catholic who thought that he had been uh, unjustly deprived of the crown and wanted to take it back. And what he did was he went up, Bonnie Prince Charlie, in northern Scotland, and he assembled these Highlanders in the northern Scottish hills and Smith describes how they made a march on London to overcome and to take back the government. They didn't make it all the way to London. But what they did do is they made it to Smith's hometown. And in 1745, this army of the Highlanders came down, and the city guard, the militia of Edinburgh, which I'll mention this because we're in Athens, Ohio. They were very proud. They called it the Athens of the North. The city guard of this extensive, opulent, commercial, polite, find civilized city. As soon as they saw the Highlanders, they put down their arms and they let them have the city without firing a fight, without making any sort of resistance. Smith is embarrassed by this. Quote, 200 years ago, such an attempt would have roused the spirit of the nation. Our ancestors were brave and warlike. Their minds were not enervated by cultivating arts and commerce. And they were all ready with spirit and vigor to resist the most formidable foe. The story of Smith's own hometown, at the time of his own life, brought home to him dramatically. What he saw was playing out this history that he's been describing in ancient Rome and in China, this theory that he had been working out for years about the threats. But most importantly, it brought home this paradox that wealthier nations are weaker nations, not in all ways, but in certain very specific ways that uh, can compromise their integrity. That, I think, is Smith's diagnosis. The question of what to do about it, only we today can figure out what to do about it. We'll look in vain for Smith's arguments about that we can you know, plug and chug into the 21st century. But I think he leaves us with a question that's more than worthy 
of a few minutes of our reflection as we think about our own future in this civilized, opulent American republic. So with that, thanks very much for your attention. I hope that I'll have sparked something. I hope we'll have a little bit of Q&A and some discussion here. So thanks very much. And Court, I think you said that I could uh, field my own questions. Yes, yes. Okay, uh, great. Selfishly, I want to ask the first question. Um, I all, my rule is always the students get the first question, but, oh, but no. you're the host, so I'm oh, going to defer. Oh, yeah, okay. No, 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 go ahead. I, I, I'm reading the theory moral sentiments. He, in one of the first sections, uh, talks about our natural inclination to uh, you know, praise the wealthy and dislike the poor. Yeah. And so I'm curious how that fits into this framework. Does it, does that tendency increase with opulence? Does it contribute to this internal threat? Yeah, so, so this is a really important part of Smith's moral psychology and how it applies to, to his economics. So one of the arguments, if people have read the theory of moral sentiments, even if you haven't, one of the things he says is, why do we wish to become rich? Why do we engage in our bettering of our condition? And he says that it's because we wish, these are his words, we wish to be approved, to be noticed, to be um, uh, received with sympathy and approbation. We were talking, again, at dinner a little bit, we're talking about social media. Why do we want to be rich? It's the same reason why we curate our persona on uh, Instagram, so that we can attract likes, attract approbation, have people pat us on the back, and we'll have more followers. That's why we want to be rich. Smith thinks that, by and large, that's a potentially very good thing. That incentivizes our actions in ways that are often productive for our bottom line, both for ourselves, and it's good for our society if people, the last thing he wants to do is kill the incentives to become rich. What Smith does worry about is that if human beings exclusively think about how they look in the eyes of others, if the only thing they care about are the appearances, they'll be less receptive to certain other things that are very important in their own lives. And so Smith talks a lot about the difference between how we want to appear to other people and what we actually are. And so he uses, a, there's different ways to do this. In 17th century French thought, they had two verbs, être and paratre, to be and to appear. And there are all these sorts of conflicts between the two. Smith talks about the difference between praise and praiseworthiness. Do we just want other people to like us and praise us and, and tell us we look great? Or do we want to be praiseworthy? Do we want to be good in our own way? Smith thinks that the engines of commercial society often tack in the direction of the approval, the esteem, the appearances. And this has positive social benefits. But also, I keep coming back to that negative externality language. It has to be moderated some way so that we don't entirely succumb to simply becoming what other people want us to be. That we don't, you know, if I was going to do pop psychology, that we don't lose ourselves or lose our sense of ourselves. So I think the great question for Smith is always, how do we keep that engine of economic progress that undeniably brings great things, what he calls universal opulence, commercial growth, for, despite the many things I've said, is also a very net gain for him. But how do we do that without also uh, running the risk of some of these forms of corruption, to use his word? Did that get to the question? Yeah, thanks, great question. You started off by talking about Gibbons, mm -hmm. and I've been pondering in my own mind lately. I said, God, Gib Gibbons, Gibbons kind of hit it pretty the nail on the head about some of America's yeah. recent uh, problems and decline and so forth. <coughs> Is there older extension of the empire? Mm -hmm. There's all these kind of things or themes in Gibbons, and there are themes, but it seems to me they're pretty much. The same thing they, in, in Smith, mm -hmm. uh, expressed a little differently. Did Gibbons and Smith, you said they were friends, did they spend a lot of time talking about these things? Do you know? Yeah, so, so, so here's the challenge. So, so the, the short answer is they spent some time. There's some correspondence between them. But Smith didn't keep much of his correspondence. He found it difficult to write. He, had, he hated, his handwriting is terrible. It looks like a six-year-old and is all cramped. And he also had all his papers burned on his, on his deathbed. So there's a lot that we don't know. What, what, what we do know is that from the little of correspondence that they had, that they were mutual admirers. And they were also friends in um, one of the very important clubs that was in London. So there's a really good popular, since you guys are going to London, those of you who are going to London, may I recommend a book if you want to do some of this stuff. There's a book written by a Harvard historian recently called The Club. And it's all about 
the philosophers who were at the heart of all of the machinations at the time of the American Revolution in London. And so it was Gibbon, Smith, Samuel Johnson, Edmund Burke. These are important big heavy hitters and they got together and they had dinner and drinks together and talked about philosophy. You can even go to see where the club met. But it's a good book, so that's how they knew each other. What's that? Oh, now I have to go back to the book. Yeah. Never mind, we'll talk about that later. But I, I just think it's important. Uh, you know, there's a lot of evidence that America is having problems these days, declines these days. People don't want to join the military. We were talking about the military earlier. The military can't get soldiers. Uh, uh, our nation's running up huge debts. And, uh, Bread and circuses, all of Gibbons, etc., and uh, dropping money out of airplanes and running in massive debts. America today, not America 50 or 100 years ago. What has happened? Well, it seems to me Smith and Gibbon are both insightful on this. Yeah, no, I agree. And, you know, I, I, one of the, I really, I, I, this is in many ways for the undergrads. For, I, so I have a daughter your age, she was an undergraduate in college. I think a lot about the future of our nation and being able to perpetuate the good things that we've been given. And I think a lot about the challenges that are before us. Many of these challenges I think are very familiar and get over talked about. There are other challenges that I think don't get talked about enough. And so this is one of my ways of trying to, frankly, um, use a turn to the history of political philosophy to help us reflect upon our own age and the sorts of challenges that are before us now, especially those that go beyond challenges that we just know so well about polarization, all these sorts of things. There's other big challenges out there too that also deserve our attention. But you might not agree, and that would be good. If you tell me that all of this we don't need to worry about because we've already got solutions to it, I'll sleep much better tonight, and I'll know that we all have a collective future. Um, I really think you bring a cool perspective to ask with, but I haven't considered before, so I want to thank you for that. But, um, so, <laughs> you know, you talk about like, um, so commercialization makes you more susceptible to external threats mm -hmm. and puts a decline in the militia. And I want to bring on that challenge of like modern day, do you still see that? Because when I think of commercialization, I think of some of the most powerful nations currently mm -hmm. and where I see like most global GDP and that's what's controlling it. And all, I understand the examples of like Rome and China. I just want to know if you, how do you see that in a modern sense? Yeah, so I think that that's really important. So, um, I've been spending time in Southeast Asia and thinking about America's strategic interest there as well. And, you know, I think one of the great challenges that we're going to face, some people noticed that I was carrying a, um, a folder that had some ancient, it's classical Chinese writing on it that I got in Taiwan. And I think anybody who's sensitive to the questions of Taiwan and its national independence right now recognizes that some of the things Smith is talking about here are very live. There's a way in which Smith's question is not our question. He's talking about rich nations and poor nations, civilized societies and nations of shepherds. So far as I can tell, you know, that doesn't explain our relationship with our neighbors to the north or to the south. That's not Canada and Mexico. But this question about military readiness, and not just in terms of willingness to fight, but just in the basics of, I mean, I'm an amateur on this, so again, if people know more about this, I'm always happy to learn, but my understanding of our, the American fleet in Southeast Asia, of the Merchant Marine and the number of people that we have to operate these boats, it's not good. How does one say it other than that? And it's gonna happen in the next two years. Almost every China scholar I know thinks that there is going to be armed conflict in the South China Sea and that we're not ready for it. So um, Smith, oh, and for me, the question why Smith comes in, I, and look, I'm gonna say I'm not a military strategist. I don't know whether we should fight. I don't know whether they're diplomatic. None of, all of that's well beyond me. But I think Smith, to my mind, helps me understand why we're in the position we are in terms of military readiness, the ability, or our inability to fight wars on two fronts, our inability to have a Navy, some of those things I think Smith really does get right, and that really matter for geopolitical reasons right now. Do you want to follow up? I was just going to say that actually, one of my more previous talks, we did have a military strategist coming back, uh -huh. 
And with what you're saying in Southgate Asia, I can actually see a lot of parallels with what he is saying now, like, and how Smith could be. Of course, he didn't talk about the Smith. He talked about yeah, yeah. how he's worried about our current situation. Now I'm trying to, I can see though how. how it Good. I mean, so what? Again, I think take very seriously specialization and division of labor. I'm a historian of 18th century political thought, but I'm also an engaged American citizen that cares about our future. So when I talk about those things, I talk out of a position of expertise. But I hope that I can put out arguments that can go to those who are also learning from people with that genuine expertise and see whether they dovetail in that particular way. I think it's important to, that kind of crosstalk is important to get specialists so that they can each deliver their perspectives and see how they match up or don't match up. Yeah. Good. Do you think any of the points that um, Smith made, anything he said in other work, could maybe explain why there is a distrust in those people who have been instructed so? Um, distrust in science, which is a healthy thing at times, but mm -hmm. to an extent where it, it harms a lot of people, like mm -hmm. where large populations don't um, abide by vaccine. You're talking about like COVID like, vaccine skepticism. Oh, well, yeah. and, uh, like mumps, for mm -hmm. example, that was a big problem for a while, or um, like climate change when evidence is there mm -hmm. and people ignore what people like what scientists have said, mm -hmm. do you, or even critical race theory, I mean, the list goes on and yeah, on, yeah, yeah. but no. yeah, what do, do you think that speaks to that distrust in the educated at all, or? Yeah, let me, it's a good question, because I think that putting our moment next to Smith's moment on this front is really helpful, because one of the things Smith is suggesting is not that the workers should try to solve everything themselves, but it's that they need to be able to judge when they hear people in positions of authority delivering certain sorts of dictums that they can be trusted to judge. And I think Smith was actually pretty much an optimist about human nature. He didn't live in a democratic age, but I see no reason to think that he wouldn't think that we could make democratic deliberations and judgments. But it's because he thought that people that were not harmed, that were educated, in the way he proposes, would be able to make judgments and to take in positions, things that were delivered from positions of authority. Our age is really different. The skepticism towards authority is very high. And we talked a little bit about this with sort of polarization. We all know about echo chambers and what philosophers call epistemic bubbles. People self-segregate into groups where they have their own priors reaffirmed. They already believe something. They want more evidence for why they already believe it. And they don't want to engage the other side. That, I think, I don't know that Smith could have seen that coming. But when Smith reminds us that we need to have faith that people can actually be trusted to make judgments, and we live in this sort of society in which we don't know where to look for the authority on which to make our judgments, that helps clarify the difference. Yeah. Does that? Yeah. Because I don't know how to solve the problem of, you know, yeah, many of the things you describe are very complex, but you know, the advantage of Smith is that he forces us to ask this question, you know, what do we do now since authority does seem to be questioned in the public sphere? There might be good positives that come out of that, but there's also a lot of dislocation and a lot of potential chaos. Yeah. Um, given what you just said about um, the people being trusted to make their own judgments mm -hmm. on authority, um, what would Smith's take be on the electoral college and how it's developed. Mm -hmm. uh -huh. That's interesting. Um, <laughs> there, there's no hot button passage that you can go to that will suggest, I mean, Smith wasn't thinking in terms of constitutional structure. I mean, he was in, in an inherited ancient constitutional regime like Britain was, it's very different. But what he does talk a little bit about is um, the Continental Congress that was emerging, he says some extraordinary things about um, the men who went from being shopkeepers and artisans to being the great legislators of the new nation. And what he means by that is, you know, the people that I think of in my new hometown of Boston, you know, the Adams, the, uh, you know, all the founding fathers. And he thinks that they were um, wise, they were trustworthy, they were visionary, 
They were principled, and they were inspiring people under them. That's not the same thing as just saying, just trust them to make all the decisions, and that you know, there would be like either Senate aristocracy or something like uh, a, a hard form of the Electoral College. But Smith did seem to think that there was something about the emerging American quote unquote elite that was not an aristocratic elite, but was an elite that came up through the ranks and was um, making genuinely good decisions for the benefit of the country and also inspiring people below them. It's a wonderful set of passages. Do it, go on to like the online works and just look up the word shopkeepers if you do a little like keyword search and you'll get the passage on the American Continental Congress. And it's wonderful, it's inspiring and Smith thinks it's inspiring. I think he's less cynical to get to your question, than we might be today about uh, the capacities for certain trans-democratic bodies, for lack of a better, better word. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so I know we discussed the vision of labor, and mm -hmm. from Smith's view, the um, solution to that is education. How does that match up with today's society where there's a growing number of people who are college educated, community mm -hmm. college educated, or have the entire internet, internet at their fingertips? Mm -hmm. Good. We'll say another sentence, though. So do, are you suggesting that we have an educated people today because of all these things? Yeah, the of labor still somewhat exists. And yet we've got this yeah, education. Yeah. Yeah. Growing access to education that obviously like a lot of people didn't have in the 18th century. Mm -hmm. um, I'm just wondering like how that translates to today's society. The yeah. idea of the vision of labor and education being a solution, but we have the solution available to us, but we're still seeing a problem. Ah, so then the question becomes, has the way the solution emerged, or is our solution today the same as Smith's solution? So here's Smith's solution. We have to talk a little, well, I didn't talk much about the solution, we talked about the problem. So what Smith suggests, to offset all this nasty stuff about the division of labor, he says that you need two things, and he discriminates between what we today would call primary and secondary school education on the one hand, and university education on the other. What he insists has to be funded at taxpayer expense is a universal system of public education. Children need to get you know, the, the very basics of reading, writing, arithmetic, science. And that was a very, I mean, he's, he's the first person in Western civilization to propose that. I mean, he, I know it sounds ironic, but the father of the modern public school is Adam Smith in a very specific way. But he doesn't think that university education is quite as necessary for political reasons. And he also thinks a lot of university education is an absolute waste. And he thinks it's because of the way it's been structured. We were just talking about this a little bit. He thinks that what we today call tenure is terrible, and that the only way to actually have a legitimate university education is for students to pay their faculty directly for the courses that they literally take from them. He wanted to create a competition model to bring out better teaching in which he would actually incentivize good teaching rather than arguably the way it's done now in which, you know, to be very honest, I, I, I'm gonna get a modest honorarium for this. I'd get it whether I gave a good talk or a bad talk. And Smith thinks that's problematic. You wanna incentivize people to give them a good talk. I think I would, well, maybe this is, I don't know, maybe, maybe now it's not, maybe they'll get cut. But, uh, but, um, but this idea that uh, there's different needs and different ways of providing education at different levels. So he was really concerned about what we think today of like getting it while they're young. Like universal kindergarten, that's very much in line with Smith. All the other things like community colleges and four-year universities, I think he might be more skeptical towards that. But do you, want to, you, you might want to follow up though because it might not quite get to the question that you're most worried about. He, is he proposing like a moral education or like a critical literacy towards like political ideas? Because we have universal kindergarten in the United States. Yeah. Um, you still see a lot of people working jobs that they hate or have to choose to get by. Maybe that's just about availability or mm -hmm. competition for jobs. I don't know. Um, I'm a historian. Um, but is it is it like you know? Is he more trying to get at that you know? The political yeah, okay, so that's great. The education that he thought was most important was not, say, cultural literacy. It's not even moral education. It's rather, we use a very hackneyed and trite phrase today, critical thinking skills. You ask anybody, professor, what they're trying to provide, you want a safe answer, you say critical thinking skills, and it sounds like it can be meaningless. 
But with the problems he's just described here, stupidity, lack of judgment, lack of being able to discriminate between authority, you begin understanding why critical thinking skills are not just squishy little education talk, but something that really matters. So the good public education provides all members of the society with real critical thinking skills. So now to get back to your original question, does our public education today do that? No, and an hour I ask why. Yeah, and that I got nothing, because uh, uh, I'm sure there's all kinds of reasons. The best I can do is to clarify what Smith wanted, and I think you're already recognizing, that just because it's in the form of public education at taxpayer expense, it doesn't solve the problem unless it does this particular X, which is teach real critical discernment. And that's why it's necessary politically. Whether we aspire to do that today, whether we think it should do that today, I think it's a debate that we should have. But for my purposes, clarifying what Smith thinks we need and helping us see that that's not what we might be arguably achieving today is really the important part. Yeah. What's that? Okay, good. Yeah? Um, so going back to judgment, faction, submission, mm -hmm. I feel like this is almost foreshadowing to like the contemporary polarization of social media where we lose our sense of rationality, diversity of thought um, to basically confirm our own biases. Mm -hmm. biases. Um, so what implications do you think this has on our democracy and our voting process? Mm -hmm. Is there like a tendency to act on our inclinations instead of considering a variety of perspectives and range of experts to conclude what may truly be best for the nation on a long-term basis? And if so, how do you think we can resolve this? Yeah. So um, can I put it into what Smith thinks we should do to resolve this? Because Smith's answer is, and I'm going to paraphrase a little bit, but I'll tell you where it comes from. Go out and talk to strangers. And what he means by that, it's not exactly what we talk about today, hear the other side of the story. But he thinks that when we only exist within our immediate peer group, we sort of have feedback mechanisms, and he describes the psychology of this. He calls it sympathy and spectatorship, that we sort of reaffirm some of those, what we tend to think of as in-group biases. But when we go, and he talks about a young man who moves into a large city, and he talks all the time about what it's like to live in a society in which you're not an intimate familiar of everyone, how you might have to act, how you have to deal with strangers, how you come to understand common norms and common agreement. So Smith thinks, uh, you know, in many ways, we, we use the language of like cosmopolitanism today. Sometimes we throw that around a lot. But Smith thinks it's really important for people in a modern commercial democratic society to encounter genuine difference, to interact with genuine difference, because from that plurality of difference come certain shared norms and agreements that we otherwise don't get if we're all factionalized, tribalized, and all existing in very small little groups. Smith thinks that's very dangerous. And so when he's calling faction and sedition, he's thinking about it in terms of that. So the best way to break that up is through things like the activities that bring us into contact with others, not least of which, international trade and commerce that expose us to other people, that expose us to other ways of life. Smith thinks that that is eminently healthy and important. So I think Smith's answer is, again, um, we talk about encountering difference, but he really, he doesn't, he, I think, believes that all the way down, that that's a healthy thing, not just a little slogan or something but that that is endemic to what a healthy democracy needs is a real engagement with fundamentally different people that you still are able to, as he likes to say, find, he doesn't say common norms, but we find when we reach out to genuinely different people, I love his metaphor, he uses a musical metaphor since we're in this, this, this recital hall. He talks about how we start meeting in the middle and we don't become unisons, but we reach harmony or concord. When we were with people that we are, are find genuinely different, we don't always ultimately see things exactly the same way they do, but we have enough appreciation of how they do that we create something called harmony or concord, right? So like the first, the third, the fifth of root tones, same way in society. We don't all agree, but we are able to exist at the level in which we have shared commonalities, even if we're not exactly equal. And we can't do that unless we actually encounter things that are really alien to 
Yeah. So that makes sense to me, but like you and I might consider doing that, but I feel like there's a subset of the population that's not so inclined to do that and might just feel as though it's almost like countering the enemy in a way. So like, I guess how can we convince others to think this way and perhaps engage in this course with you know, people that aren't like that? I guess. Yeah. Look, I, I won't go down the list of things. I've been engaged in a couple of different experiments that try to bring people of genuine difference together. So in 2016, I got a public grant to actually do some, um, uh, in the fall of 2016, October, November of 2016, to get very different types of voters together for a set of intimate long dinners in which they would have engagement and debate. That was a very easy sort of, you know, red, blue sort of across the divide sort of thing. but. Um, I'm not convinced that we don't have fora where there are people actually encountering other sides. We talked even at dinner a little bit about um, one of my universities, we've got the policy that alums are able to take classes in the classroom. If you're over 65, you get to go to the classes for free. That's a remarkable thing for older people and younger people to actually sit beside each other and talk to each other. And I think the age divide is a really big issue in our country right now. But I think that there's also ways of putting people together in terms of rural, urban. You're right. Is there going to be 100% buy-in? Absolutely not. We shouldn't be naive. There will always be people that resist the other and don't want to talk to the other. But I think there's, I frankly think there's more goodwill than sometimes we sometimes assume there is in our quote unquote, polar, in, our, in our legitimately polarized moment. I think there's, maybe I'm a naive optimist even despite all the dark things I said here. But I think that there are certain currents, I think there's a lot of people doing good work that do try and bridge those divides in creative ways, and they're worth looking for. Going back to the first topic, we kind of start the Q&A with, with this emergence of, as you build up your tolerance, your militia or military power uh -huh. paralysis kind of on the decline due to the increased luxury, people devalue the military with longer peace times. Did Smith offer like any solutions to this so where the wealthier nation becomes, they won't become so weak in terms of like militia defending themselves. Yeah, so he gives a really interesting solution. So I mentioned he defends the the um, idea of a national army, a standing army, and he actually uses a really interesting, to my mind, locution. He twice uses this phrase. He said, "The only thing that can save this nation is the quote unquote wisdom of the state." to have the foresight to set up these national armies in peacetime. Now that's counterintuitive for two reasons. One is everybody believed that a standing army was dangerous to liberty, right? Because once you've got in peacetime all these soldiers that are all organized to fight with nothing to do, it's very easy for there to be a coup. So Smith had to push back against that as a friend of liberty. And the second idea was that, you know, Smith's reputation certainly is as a state skeptic, right? that the idea is private industry can do things much better than public industry can do. And he argues forms of that throughout. But there's certain elements of public goods, there's certain types of market failures that have to be remedied and can only be remedied by state action. He's very specific in what those are. He doesn't want those to go sprawling out. But he does think that we need the state to be wise to think ahead to solve this particular question, because otherwise, self-interested people just aren't going to serve in the military, unless they think it's in their interest, and Smith thinks it usually won't be. So I think that that's one of those counterintuitive places where he actually makes an argument that goes against the popular reputation, but is in actual keeping with his core principles. Yeah, because it kind of presents kind of like a free writing problem with long peace time, I guess, like <laughs> someone else will solve it. So, so you, you mean, mean that, that um, the, the wealthy, wealthy people still won't fight because, because we've got enough soldiers because we're paying them a wage and we can just let the other people do it? Not exactly. But What's, What's the free riding, riding problem that you're just like that people won't pay attention to the problem itself? It's more like uh, someone else will solve it. I don't know that I'm saying per se that they won't participate or fund or anything. It's just that you will pull a blind eye to it because someone else will solve it. Yeah, that's why one of the, I, I, I've struggled with this because I've written a little bit about this. It's really interesting when Smith uses those words, the wisdom of the state, because who is the state? 
it's not some sort of monolithic distant entity. It's made up of parliamentarians and voters who elected the parliamentarians. And so this brings back that he's not suggesting some, when I think he says the wisdom of the state, it's not just we should rely on someone else to take care of it. It's that we in our wisdom have to understand that we have to make a certain collective decision and authorize the state to do this sort of thing in our name. And I think that that's an interesting perspective that, right, when you, when you just hear it, yeah, I understand that sort of free rider problem. But insofar as we very literally are the state, he's talking about our prudential wisdom to make a collective decision. Front row's been busy. What about? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, yeah, please. Kind of easy question. If your interest speaks as mine is, uh, is there like a good you know, reader's guide or companion to read alongside the Wealth of Nations to get a, just a good feeling for what's going on? Yes, there is. There are several. Um, and it's always a pleasure to recommend the work of friends. So, there was a book literally called The Reader's Guide to the Wealth of Nations that was recently published by a very good economist named Jerry Avensky at, uh, at Syracuse University. And so it works through all of the arguments. I think it's a great way if you want to have it as your companion. Um, Jerry also did the favor. I put together a collection for Princeton University Press about five years ago, and he wrote a condensed 5,000-word version of that. So if you're really pressed for time, go see Jerry Avensky in a book called Adam Smith, His Life, Thought, and Legacy. But um, there's several companions. I'll mention two others. If you're an economic historian, another great companion is the Routledge Companion to the Wealth of Nations by a friend and co-author, Maria Paganelli, who's an economist. And if you're a philosopher, one of the best philosophers working on Adam Smith is a man named Samuel Fleischacker, who wrote um, uh, a book called The Philosophical Guide to the Wealth of Nations, where he sort of pulls out some of the more theoretical or philosophical problems that an economist. So Sam Fleischacker, if you're a philosopher, um, Maria Paganelli, if you're an economic historian, and uh, uh, Jerry Avensky, if you want sort of a detailed, systematic work of the whole thing all the way through. Yeah. Okay. All right. Thank you guys for attending. Yeah, thank you. Uh -huh.